I have a personal confession to make. Games did save my life. Would you like to know how have games uh, saved me and helped me become the person, a professional, the entrepreneur I always wanted to be? Hang on with me. I will cover all of that in just a moment. But first of all, let me introduce myself and my company to you. I am Ahmed Al-Mashhadi, the CEO of MashLab. I'll try to summarize my professional experience and background in just a few lines. Please bear with me because I've, I've got multiple hats here. I am the lead uh, games and gamification conceptualizer and ideator. I'm also a business consultant and strategist. I'm a market research consultant. I'm a simulation and predictive modeling professional. Last but not least, I'm a startup mentor. I consider myself um, a lucky man indeed, uh, having a profession that combines uh, my passion, my imagination, my ambitions, my innovation, uh, creativity, and expertise and knowledge, and also my uh, general mission to positively impact my society. So Mash Lab is, uh, is this melting pot that helps me put everything in place and into action. So now I will walk you over uh, what we do at Mesh Lab. Uh, we specialized uh, mainly in, um, uh, in, in, in Mesh Lab in game development and gamification. We do all types of games, board games, card games, mobile, PC, uh, web games, game, gamified marketing solutions, gamified market research solutions. Although uh, we can do any type of games, uh, including VR, AR, and uh, artificial intelligence backed uh, solutions, but we pride ourselves at uh, specializing in uh, games for business and uh, purposeful games. Uh, the games for business, uh, the type of games that are used uh, to help business either boost sales, um, engage more customers, counterattack competition, and so on and so forth. So the games that have this kind of business-related uh, missions. Uh, we also specialize in purposeful games, uh, the games that have uh, certain missions, objectives to achieve and fulfill. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, the type of games that will help uh, boost the efficiency of education, the type of game that will help uh, boost the efficiency of uh, you know, uh, energy consumption, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Our process is quite simple. Uh, we start at ideation and all the way uh, through design, development, planning, deployment, evaluation, and then upgrading. But we can step in at any stage of development, depending on the requirements of the project or uh, the game that we are invited to uh, participate in. I will share with you uh, my journey as a gamer. You know, uh, my, my passion for gaming uh, is dated back to when I was uh, about six or, or probably younger. Uh, I was always so much attached and captivated by mechanical contraptions and the games with the deconstruct deconstructible parts. Uh, then started phasing into electronic, uh, electronic games and gaming consoles. They offered me um, uh, somehow limitless imagination and quenched my thirst for discovery and experientialism. I evolved and grew up with games, but the best part is I instantly become that six-year-old boy full of energy, passion, curiosity the moment I get into a game. So gaming has made me ageless. As promised, uh, now I will tell you how I was saved by the games. Uh, some 13 or 14 years ago, uh, I was running um, a startup business. Uh, we offered uh, uh, um, uh, innovative market research uh, slash business consulting services. We merged uh, gaming uh, with market research to unearth uh, the target audience's uh, deepest unspoken needs. Uh, we even introduced for the first time back then the virtual shopping solution uh, uh, to study shoppers' uh, in-store behaviors and dynamics all virtually. Uh, we ran operations solely on networked data collection practices and, uh, and, uh, and solutions. Uh, while most of our competitors and companies uh, back then uh, were still using paper and pencil and also charging uh, their clients uh, data entry fees. Uh, we were doing so well uh, that we were awarded among uh, Saudi's uh, fastest 100 companies. Uh, then the global recession came into play and the research uh, activities uh, became all of a sudden excluded from the company's uh, survival cuts. Uh, let alone the unattainability of collection, 
uh, or uh, any funding or borrowing uh, options. Uh, several months later, uh, we were out of business and company was shut down, so sadly. Uh, about the same time, uh, my mother was diagnosed with uh, pelvic cancer in a, uh, in a later stage. Uh, so as financially and mentally devastated with no job, uh, no savings, no income, no way, probably no way out, uh, given the uncertainty about the recession recovery as I was now, um, emotionally had to by my mother's severe illness and my helplessness. So what normally happens uh, when we become helplessly hopeless? Yes, you're absolutely right. Depression with suicidal thoughts wandering around us. Uh, I fell into a, a black hole of endless depression uh, that not only started to eat me alive, but also affected my focus, concentration, brain functionality, and cognition. Little did I know that my old habit of gaming would step up and come by to save me and fortify me against the relentless attacks of suicidal thoughts. My games and the teams I was part of during this period were my only friends with whom I felt relieved, rejuvenated, with an overwhelming feeling of resurrection. So I was uh, some sort of a uh, phoenix. As I was advancing in levels, ranks, medals, and becoming among the top team players, applying complex strategies and techniques, I started little by little regaining my self-confidence, self-appreciation, and then self-recognition and motivation. That gradual sense of accomplishment and recognition was indeed building me back up from the inside and I started feeling this cannot be it. I must come back. Several months later, I was back in business at 10 times the energy, the confidence, the imagination with a handful of brands and titles under my belt. Not only did gaming profoundly bring me back from the dead, but also gave me a lifetime mission to touch and impact other lives. Enough said about my personal story. Now let's jump into the topic. What we're going to speak about today is gaming psychology and gaming as a change agent. Our agenda for today will have three main parts. Uh, the first part uh, where we will talk about uh, why do we actually play games? We will go over uh, the key drivers, motives, and attributes. And also we'll talk about um, games engagingness, uh, UX versus UJ. It's an interesting concept. I just want to bring to your attention. And last uh, in that section, uh, we would be talking about uh, uh, also an equally interesting model that we came up with uh, at MeshLab. The second part would be the case studies uh, with the interesting insights on um, um, gaming um, impactfulness. Uh, we will have uh, as many as four studies, uh, case studies to speak about, uh, don't worry, briefly. And then the last part of the session uh, would be a recap uh, where I share uh, the key takeouts and my recommendation to uh, game creators. So let's get started. Why do we play games? Uh, that's a very interesting question, and um, I'm sure most of us um, ask this question um, at a point in time. There are uh, six main uh, attributes uh, related to uh, playing games. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, existential, the existential attributes, and the second is experiential uh, attributes, uh, then the social uh, gratification attributes, uh, intellectual, and then developmental attributes. If we take the first one, the existential attributes, you would have individuality, uh, ego and distinction, escapism, uh, self-proof. So these are the main attributes associated with, uh, with playing a game from an existential standpoint. So th this is from a personal uh, oneself standpoint, uh, our main drivers that would uh, push us to play games. We need to prove that we are uh, unique and distinct. Our ego uh, somehow uh, drives us uh, to go to go this route. And sometimes uh, our reality is not that great. Uh, so we, we, we want to escape our uh, probably painful or uh, unpleasant reality and to start um, indulging ourselves in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in an environment uh, on our own. When it comes to the second set of attributes related to uh, experiential, we would have uh, breaking the norms, uh, full immersion, unconditional liberty, and then on-demand adventure. The third uh, set of attributes uh, that is social, 
uh, we would have uh, popularity, sense of belonging, unified mission, rivalry, and superiority. So these are the social related attributes that would actually uh, push us to engage in a gaming experience. Uh, we have also gratification uh, that would include uh, joyfulness, uh, leisure, uh, rewards and awards, fulfillment and self-sufficiency. So these are the type of attributes that will actually uh, get us uh, engaged in, uh, in gaming experience. Uh, we have as well uh, intellectual uh, that would include show of uh, knowledgeability, problem solving skills, conquering challenges. Last but not least, we have developmental attributes that uh, are related to uh, circumstantial compulsion, uh, self-realization, sense of achievement, evolutionary urge. So these are all the type of needs or uh, motives that would make one play a game. Uh, now in this slide, we'll be talking about games engagingness, uh, UX versus UJ. Of course, everybody knows UX. Uh, the, uh, the term that uh, we want to put emphasis on today is basically uh, the UJ. Uh, the UX is, uh, is, is mainly uh, the experience uh, that one has, uh, you know, operating or interacting with an app, uh, and, and in this case, a game. So this, this period, you know, uh, the, 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 the time that is controlled by UEX uh, is very limited uh, when it comes to the overall or the lifetime journey of, uh, of a gamer or, or a user. Uh, so these, uh, the, the, the long uh, lifetime journey uh, um, has a lot of different uh, opportunities uh, for games. Let's say if we increase uh, the, the kind of value adding uh, or uh, the contribution to gamers' lives uh, outside the, of the games, uh, that period of UX would actually increase. So uh, ultimately, uh, or ideally, uh, what we want to achieve here is basically to have uh, the maximum UXs out of the UJ. Uh, so uh, uh, how how is that uh, achievable? Uh, basically by intervening with values. So uh, the game should be stand for something uh, uh, valuable uh, in, the, in the gamer's eyes. Let's say uh, either it's, uh, the experience uh, or uh, you know the knowledge, the details, the features, uh, the, the kind of experience they have with the game uh, uh, is extendable. So it can be extended outside the time they spend on the game itself. Let's say if I play a game, that will teach me a skill. Uh, probably uh, when I go outside that game, uh, I will still be using the skill. I will still be referring to the type of information or details I learned through the game. Uh, it happened to me so many times, uh, personally. You know, um, I, uh, I played uh, a number of games uh, where I uh, got introduced to uh, historical data. Uh, you know, uh, some valuable information about history, about, uh, you know, the world history and so on and so forth. Uh, so this type of information, uh, when I'm outside the game and I'm in, uh, in a discussion with a, in a conversation with the, somebody, I refer to the type of details or this, these specific, uh, you know, details I learned through the game. And so it actually, uh, the game comes on top of my mind. So these incidents uh, are considered value intervention opportunities. These are higher level of involvement uh, spots or time slots. So if, we, if, if your game can actually uh, uh, make sure or ensure uh, that uh, it has got enough value intervention uh, elements, uh, that would guarantee for you that your, your UXs will be extended uh, and to try to cover as much as of the UJ. Of course, the, there isn't any one game that actually can be, uh, you know, uh, uh, limiting uh, uh, one uh, one gamer's uh, lifetime journey. But of course, it's in our best interest uh, to have uh, the game that we develop uh, contributing greatly in our gamers' lives by uh, spending either uh, more time on our system or actually by expanding and maximizing 
the time uh, we are recalled in their minds and hearts outside the game. Uh, now, uh, in this slide, we'll be talking about user longevity, uh, which is pretty much related to what we uh, what we spoke about in the previous slide, uh, where we talked about the lifetime journey. In this case, uh, uh, in this slide, we'll be uh, sharing uh, an interesting model that we came up with uh, at MashLab. Uh, giving uh, some, uh, giving uh, a recipe how we can actually increase uh, user longevity and increase our share uh, across uh, or out of the uh, user uh, lifetime journey. Uh, the model is the 3E CGL. 3E equals CGL. Uh, uh, here we have three E's. Uh, the first E is excitement, the second E is experience, the third E is empowerment. The, the model is basically uh, if we uh, create uh, excitement for our gamers and we create uh, unforgettable experience and we empower them in app or out of app, uh, that would lead to uh, helping uh, our gamers to gain confidence. So they will be uh, more confident probably through the information, the knowledge, the experience, the skills they learned through our game, uh, they become uh, more uh, confident. And with confidence uh, comes gratitude because they will always say, okay, this is a game that uh, taught me this uh, particular information, uh, this piece of information, or uh, this game is the, the game that actually taught me the skill or uh, this is the experience that I encountered uh, playing this game. So uh, this sense of gratitude uh, will actually help uh, create uh, more engagement. So uh, out of gratitude and appreciation, they will come back and you know become part of our franchise. So they will become frequently, uh, they will become frequently attached and uh, you know more engaged into our system. And this uh, frequent engagement will uh, uh, develop uh, as loyalty. So this is uh, uh, more or less a, a model. Uh, it's a strategic and operational model that every game creator can embrace, uh, create excitement, experience, and empowerment. And this empowerment will lead into confidence. Confidence will uh, generate uh, and develop uh, gratitude, and gratitude will uh, develop engagement and uh, frequent engagement will develop loyalty. Now I will walk you through some key findings and insights about the impact of gaming as a catalyst behind some R&D work and products we have deployed. Uh, the flow and structure that we will be following uh, in this uh, part of the presentation, uh, we, we would uh, start with the challenge. And, uh, and uh, with the challenge, we will discuss uh, uh, an assumption, and, and for that assumption, uh, we will introduce a solution that will be tested with gamers and the target audiences. And after the testing, uh, or uh, these case studies are really tested, but you know, I'm just uh, trying to explain to you how the flow works. Uh, uh, so I will be sharing what exactly we did uh, uh, in testing it, and then. Uh, we'll be sharing key uh, findings or uh, the key highlights of uh, the results or the outcomes of the test and the research. So the first challenge that we uh, that we have here is how can we cultivate more entrepreneurs? So this is a challenge. Uh, this challenge uh, is not related to gaming, but can we solve or can we boost the cultivation of entrepreneurs using games? So this is this is a kind of challenge. So the assumption here is if we introduce and educate entrepreneurship through gaming at younger ages, we will boost overall familiarity with entrepreneurship and we will help instill basic fundamental knowledge. And that will lead to increasing startup success rates, which will ultimately affect and boost uh, the sustainability of our economic growth. So this is a kind of assumption. Uh, if you can see here in the, the normal curve uh, of entrepreneurship, so entrepreneurs uh, also follow a normal curve. Uh, the majority of people, uh, of people or uh, the majority of populations uh, have the possibility of becoming entrepreneurs uh, if they acquire uh, the fundamental uh, entrepreneurial qualities. 
and personality traits. Uh, but you have uh, a small portion of the world's population who are uh, naturally or inborn entrepreneurs. So they are born with the needed qualities to become very successful. And you have also the non-existent immune qualities, those, uh, this uh, portion of the populations uh, that they don't really have uh, the needed uh, qualities. So, so here, uh, the assumption is basically, if we focus on the acquirable entrepreneurial qualities uh, portion of the curve, and we introduce uh, tools and solutions uh, to uh, uh, familiarize entrepreneurship um, among the young ages, uh, we would have a higher chances of generating more entrepreneurs uh, so let's say uh, this is more of an entrepreneur's uh, making machine. So we'd have a huge uh, number of people who are interested to become entrepreneurs. So we'd have a portion of that will actually do business and portion of those who do business, uh, their business would uh, flourish and uh, succeed. So uh, the more we have, the, the more people we have into uh, the pipeline, and, you know, the more uh, uh, higher success rate we can end up having. So this is, this is basically the assumption. So how we can do this? So how can we introduce such a complicated and complex topic to uh, young ages? Uh, what we did at MeshLab, we created uh, a solution, uh, which is a hybrid gaming solution. It's a board game plus mobile app uh, that will teach uh, the principles of entrepreneurs very interactively uh, and very, very uh, smartly. Uh, so it's a more of a simulation uh, game uh, that will help uh, young ages, uh, young generation to interact with the principles of entrepreneur uh, of entrepreneurship, uh, so they can start their business, uh, they can grow their business, they can sell, uh, they can acquire other businesses. Uh, the uh, the game has also pitching elements, so they will have to pitch to uh, these uh, six different types of uh, of uh, investors. So uh, the game has a role playing um, uh, element also. Uh, so through the game, they will they will learn the basics and fundamentals of entrepreneurship, uh, how uh, equities uh, uh, gets uh, how equities get transferred, how dividends get distributed, and so on and so forth. So they will learn also the basics of pitching. And they will be under the time pressure. So uh, the, so this is the kind of solution that we wanted to introduce uh, and to test. And now it comes to the testing part. We tested this uh, gaming solution. Um, as a usage and attitude test and we did also a recall after three months just to make sure that the information they learned through the game and the experience they have they still recall a part of it so uh, we uh, tested the game uh, among 500 gamers uh, aged into two groups one group from 7 to 14 and the second group from uh, 15 and above uh, the, the solution itself is, is called the Startup County. It's a hybrid gaming solution, board game plus a mobile app. So what we what we got at the end of the of the of the research is basically uh, uh, this is uh, all the numbers here are versus control legs. I mean the legs that the the the, 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 the kind of segment that is not introduced to this game. So we compared the the the, the two legs. The one those who have seen. The game and those who haven't seen the game or played the game, uh, what kind of uh, uh, increase, or what kind of improvement uh, we got uh, by introducing the game? So, so the game helped us uh, reduce ambiguity about entrepreneurship by 22%, and also the solution uh, helped us uh, increase the general understanding of the principles of entrepreneurship by 17%. And the game also uh, helped in, uh, in increasing the willingness to become an entrepreneur at the right time by 36%, which is uh, quite significant. So the second uh, uh, case study I, I want to, to walk you through is basically uh, a second challenge. The challenge here is can games reduce household energy consumption inefficiency? So this is the challenge. Can games do this? Okay, the assumption here is targeting six to 15 years of, uh, of age, uh, introducing ways 
to uh, ways to build good energy consumption awareness that would lead to instilling good energy consumption behaviors and practices that will lead to decreasing uh, it, uh, the household electricity bill and improve the, uh, the household cash outlay, which uh, will ultimately contribute to economic growth and sustainability. So if we introduce uh, uh, good uh, behaviors and practices, how to deal with household energy consumption, will that lead to uh, decreasing uh, the electricity bill? Will that lead to a behavioral change? We will see. What we so what, our solution here is uh, Super Wireman. Uh, it's also a hybrid gaming solution, which uh, consists of a board game plus mobile game. So uh, the players here uh, are young children. Uh, they need to uh, you know interact uh, uh, with with the uh, cardboard elements that will symbolize uh, you know uh, electronic and electric equipment. Uh, at home, uh, and uh, they need to fulfill certain missions and and overcome certain challenges. Uh, so it's a full game. It's a full gameplay. Uh, but they, they through the the gaming experience, they will learn the good practices uh, how to how to deal with uh, uh, with electricity in certain situations and how to improve uh, their efficiency when it comes to uh, electricity and energy uh, at their household. Uh, so uh, the solution was tested among uh, approximately 200 gamers, age 6 to 15. And also we read the usage and attitude. So they played the game uh, uh, multiple times. And also we did a recall after uh, three months. The game uh, is called the Super Wire Man. It's a hybrid gaming solution, uh, board game plus mobile app. Uh, the key uh, highlight of the study is basically uh, the solution helped increase uh, the savings uh, in the monthly electricity bills by 15 to 18%. So just after applying the practices and the techniques or let's say the information that we uh, uh, told them through the game, uh, these uh, uh, panelists, uh, households uh, were able to save 15 to 18 percent. So just consider if we can generalize the experience to a full population. So uh, that would be uh, leading to a substantial saving uh, to, uh, to, to the government. The third challenge is how can education become more enjoyable and more effective? That's the challenge. So here's the assumption. Enhancing the perception that education is boring and obligatory, students will improve their attachment and engagement with education. So uh, in uh, previous studies, uh, it was very obvious that uh, education, generally speaking, is always uh, perceived as being old and boring. So uh, introducing the type of education that uh, students will actually perceive as being useful and smart and innovative would actually have a huge impact on uh, their educational uh, grasp and performance. So this is, the, this is the whole idea. So this is the assumption that we relied our uh, gameplay upon. If we enhance the perception about education, uh, putting education in formats that uh, would be perceived as being useful, agile, uh, smart, innovative, that will enhance the overall experience with education. Uh, so uh, enhancing this perception would, would, would also lead to transforming, uh, uh, will lead to, uh, actually, this is exactly what we did. Uh, we took uh, a portion of uh, curriculum in a certain age from uh, a K to 12. Uh, I, I think it was uh, grade three or grade four. We took uh, uh, the full curriculum and we trans transformed a part of that curriculum into interactive uh, comics. And uh, by introducing this, uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we are uh, assuming that we can improve the overall grasp and performance 
on math, science, history, English, and technology. And that would boost the general outcomes of education and increasing quality of learning. So the, the, this is a, the kind of set of assumptions that we based our gameplay upon. Now comes the solution. So what we created is basically we created uh, uh, an interactive uh, comics, interactive uh, comics uh, solution uh, that is based on uh, actual curricula. So uh, we transformed uh, uh, some uh, sections and chapters in mathematics, uh, science, technology, uh, um, English, and uh, and. Uh, Probably that would be it. Uh, I just forgot that sixth one. Uh, and we created a storyline that is quite engaging, quite compelling. So we created the concept of a super team uh, whose uh, members come from uh, across the Middle East. So we have one coming from the United Arab Emirates. We have, uh, uh, I think the leader is, uh, is coming from uh, Saudi Arabia, and we have from Morocco, we have from Syria, and we have from different uh, different countries. So we have six uh, heroes. They form up to uh, they form up as one team uh, on a mission to solve the world's uh, most challenging uh, problems. Uh, and here we are uh, actually playing on two uh, values. Uh, knowledge is superpower. So if you want to be a superpower, you need to uh, utilize knowledge. And this is exactly the kind of uh, the value that we uh, we try to instill here throughout the, uh, the experience. And the second value that we uh, are playing upon is basically the collaboration. So you alone uh, one uh, one person alone is uh, is weak, but uh, two uh, is stronger, three is much stronger, and the whole lot of us is uh, completely uh, 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 the strongest. So this is the kind of idea, and the storyline goes: uh, they will start uh, at one uh, one spot, uh, they will uh, travel to a certain country, and then. Uh, they will add another member from that country to their team, uh, covering uh, a different uh, portion or uh, uh, segment uh, uh, of knowledge. Uh, another topic, another subject that will be added on. So we can keep adding, adding, and adding uh, uh, as based uh, based on the need and based on the situation, based on uh, the actual requirement of the students. So it's, it's a highly progressive and highly adaptive uh, sort of solution. Uh, it can be uh, in any format, so each one of these superheroes can actually uh, have can have their own titles. So we can branch out uh, that solution into uh, different different uh, sub brands and subtitles. So this is the whole concept. So they will they will interact with the superheroes. They will solve problems and challenges, and by doing so, they are actually working subliminally on increasing and, uh, and enhancing uh, the grasp of the subject, uh, probably as, uh, if it's math, English, uh, science, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. So what we, what we did, we tested uh, this interactive comic solution uh, among 2,400 students and educators aged between 6 and 15. Of course, the students are the ones aged between 6 and 15. And educated, educators uh, were the ones uh, just uh, trying to get their feedback on how of an educational tool this this might be, and we got a very uh, very uh, you know uh, significant uh, wins uh, when it comes in uh, uh, the educators' appreciation and uh, recognition of the solution. So we we did also usage and attitude uh, and uh, combine uh, combined by a qualitative uh, a series of tests. Uh, the the solution name is Zircon and it's an interactive comic book. So what we got at the end of the exercise, uh, we got 88% across the 2,400. This is a weighted average. Uh, they somehow like it or like it a lot. Of course, you know our study is uh, over 250 uh, pages, uh, but uh, but I just wanted to highlight uh, the most significant uh, part, which is uh, the the likability of the concept to them and. Uh, uh, the way they saw it uh, uh, quite useful uh, in their life as as an auxiliary uh, source of information. So uh, this may not be replacing 
the typical and standard uh, uh, you know, subjects, but probably as an auxiliary source of information, uh, that might be quite uh, efficient and sufficient. So 60% uh, said that they like it a lot, and 28% of all the panelists say they somehow like it. Okay, the last challenge that we have here is how can we enhance online education? Uh, the assumption is allowing students to live a typical day at school right from their homes can improve the overall quality of the educational process and students' experience, which will lead to enhancing students' overall educational grasp and engagement that will actually boost the overall education outcomes. So what we introduce here is basically it's a solution prototype that we introduced is a virtual school. Or well, as a virtual school, it works pretty much like any any school. So the, in the school, you would have people moving around, uh, students probably playing, uh, you know, uh, chatting, eating, uh, attending classes, and so on and so forth. It's exactly what the, how uh, they can interact with this platform. So we have three main sections in the platform. We have the classrooms, and we have the community, and we have the uh, library. In the classroom, uh, as you can see, there are corridors. Uh, the students can see the bulletin boards. They can actually book into one class. So it's a highly interactive platform. Uh, students can actually go there and probably uh, not only attend their own classes, but they can meet also older students. So they can see friends from uh, uh, you know, uh, other grades as well. It's a school, you know, pretty, it works pretty much like any other school. So you can see older and younger grades uh, students. Uh, in the classroom itself, it's pretty much working like any uh, platform uh, currently, but uh, with an edge. Uh, the edge here is uh, it's, uh, highly interactive, and the edge here is... Uh, is uh, is working on and playing on the maximized uh, experience. So it's a it's like any uh, typical classroom. Uh, the students can interact uh, uh, with the teacher. That they can interact with one another, uh, and of course the sitting and uh, the look and feel. It, it gives uh, the feeling of a classroom. So uh, we are breaking the board and, uh, and, and introducing a more interesting uh, uh, schooling experience uh, for students, more especially during the COVID-19, where students are obligated to attend school at home. Uh, such a solution can actually sweeten the mix and, uh, and bring them, make them engaged into the process quite effortlessly. Uh, the second part of uh, the school is a library, uh, where you can find the interactive uh, media and you can find the ebooks and you can see all the recorded classes so let's say i missed a class i can go to this library i can uh, pick pick up the class that i missed i can uh, re-watch uh, the video and i can see what they took and what kind of homework they got and and and, and so on and so forth uh, the, the third part of the platform is basically the community this is a more of a, a social network uh, within the platform where students, parents, and teachers can actually interact. So they can add one another, they can actually uh, exchange files, uh, they can play interactive games together here, they can have uh, the enter leaderboards and you know all the kind of social activities. Uh, uh, the, the beauty about this approach is uh, you know all the parents also can uh, they are becoming part of the educational process. So they are not actually distant. They are actually involved in the process. And uh, this is exactly uh, the sort of a, a demo platform that we created. And we tested that among uh, 2,400 students and educators aged between 6 and 15. Uh, the name of the platform is Educat vSchool. And it was done as a user a usage and attitude uh, and also accompanied by a series of qualitative uh, uh, research. The key finding that we got at the end of the research, we got 74% of students and educators uh, based on a weighted average uh, said that they would probably would go and use it and definitely would go and use it.
And of course, as I said, you know, it, uh, the whole uh, report was uh, over 250 pages. So lots and lots of insights, but I just wanted to share with you the most relevant insight in the context of this case study, which is basically uh, the, uh, the willingness to use such uh, a platform uh, for homeschooling or for virtual schooling. So this is basically uh, the end of uh, the case studies. So uh, to wrap up and to give you a little bit of a recap here, I summarized uh, most of the insights uh, showcased in the, in the presentation in six points. Uh, so these are my key t uh, my key takeouts or recommendations to uh, our uh, fellow game creators. The first one is uh, I try to maximize uh, uh, gaming uh, purposefulness. So as as we uh, explained before. You know, uh, in increasing the purposefulness of the game can actually help uh, uh, boosting the longevity of uh, of the user and the engagement, and also the lifetime uh, engagement. Uh, not only uh, that, uh, you know, the short term engagement, but uh, I'm I'm talking about the the, the lifetime, the longer term engagement uh, with the game and the advocacy that comes with it. Uh, the second point uh, is uh, try to implement content-led technology, not technology-driven uh, content. Uh, I see oftentimes, or even in discussions or uh, uh, conversation with uh, with friends, that everybody wants to do AI, VR, AR. Uh, there is no problem with that. Uh, I think that is, everybody is doing this, including Mashla. But uh, what we want to, em to put emphasis here is basically uh, try to make your content uh, to, be, to be the boss. So uh, once you create uh, content, uh, you need to figure out the best way to distribute and the best way to deliver this content. So if it's uh, through AI, uh, uh, VR or AR or whatever solution, or even uh, cardboard uh, or uh, mobile app or a web uh, game, uh, it doesn't really matter, you know, because here the, 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 the content is, is boss. And we are just uh, bridging the right content with the right tool that will, uh, that, that will maximize users' engagement and, and purpose, pur uh, purposefulness uh, and efficiency. So uh, please try to, to put this in mind, implement the content-led uh, technology. So you, you, you just use the technology that will be based on the best match with the type of content, the gameplay, the storyline that you have uh, or, you, or we are working on. The third point is uh, try to boost user longevity uh, via out-of-game empowerment. So as we discussed before, you know, having this kind of uh, purposefulness, purposefulness uh, value interventions that will increase the amount of empowerment that you give to your gamers and that would actually be uh, um, uh, translated into user longevity. The fourth point uh, is actually uh, try to offer users a holistic gaming experience. So uh, uh, you need to see uh, you know uh, the slide where we discussed all the drivers and all the motives uh, we try to put your game uh, to a test against this type of, uh, you know, uh, uh, diagram. You know, how many of these are we fulfilling? You know, uh, uh, are we uh, delivering when it comes to the existential uh, attributes? Uh, are we delivering when it comes to the developmental attributes or the uh, social attributes? So we need to see how many of that you are covering through your gaming solution, and try as much as you can. To uh, to cover uh, the you know uh, a fuller uh, spectrum of these uh, attributes. The fifth point: uh, try to build gameplays upon user natural drivers, uh, which is basically related to point number four. Uh, the, the most uh, uh, dominating uh, attributes among all uh, would be the experiential and existential. So the, 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 the type of game that will be directly talking to me as a person and will touch my feelings and also the, the type of games that will actually introduce me to certain fulfilling uh, uh, adventures and experiences uh, would have better chances of uh, clicking with, with gamers uh, than uh, the games that will actually just be pure education or just pure uh, 
uh, intellectual, and they will have fewer number of, uh, of, uh, of people. Uh, so the sixth point would be uh, try to create games that further strengthen the value system. So uh, let's say uh, when we talk about the main region, uh, uh, Arabs have a certain uh, value system, uh, a value system uh, that is not so much different from other other systems. But uh, we have certain cultural, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, characteristics, uh, cultural, uh, regional, uh, and local characteristics that might make our value system uh, sensitive to some topics. So just just ensure that what you bring into the market is actually uh, helping, uh, uh, strengthening, and uh, and also uh, you know promoting uh, the, the the current value system. Like you know, uh, um, uh, this is more of a personal uh, recommendation, and this is more of a personal uh, uh, request, uh, if I may. Uh, that uh, uh, I think w uh, enough with the the violent games. Uh, Let's try to think outside the box and bring other different experiences other than people fighting and killing and you know bloodshedding and this kind of stuff. So I, I think this is just a, my personal preference. But of course, it's, it's your call. And uh, uh, but as as a gamer myself, I would love to see different experiences other than violence and uh, brutality. Uh, so I think uh, that's it uh, from a recap standpoint. In the end, I truly hope you find the session insightful. Many thanks to DGC for giving me such an opportunity. This was Ahmed Al Mashahdi of MashLab. Stay safe. وهذا كانت محادثة جدا جميلة ما بين الجيمرز والجيمين العلاقة الوطيدة مع أحمد مشهدي. That was a beautiful talk about gaming and psychology and the relationship between gamers and gaming. All thanks to Ahmed Mashahdi. And now, ladies and gentlemen, cryptocurrency. Well, on my alam el crypto. Samatu an Bitcoin, Litecoin, XRP, Ethereum, all those cryptocurrencies. What's going on? That is the real world, and we try to make sense out of it, let alone in the gaming world. Right now, with us is Max Krupachev talking about cryptocurrencies and the gaming world. Let's go.